Almost everyone in the United States at one time or another has traveled at least a stretch of old Route 66. It's um, the road where the people from Oklahoma went to California. It's a part of American history. Just the name conjures up images of going somewhere. To me, it's going back in, in, back in time, seeing things that I grew up with. So let's travel this blue highway all the way from Chicago to Santa Monica. Hello, and welcome to Blue Highways TV, cruising Route 66. We are about to start a journey that I promise you'll not soon forget. It's a journey that runs almost 2,400 miles through eight states and three time zones and back into history. But before we set out on our odyssey along the two-lane blacktop, let's take a moment to discover why this venerable American road, Route 66, has become one of the best-known highways in the world. On January 17, 1977, the weather was typical for Chicago in winter as Gus Schultz and John Chesniak entered Grant Park, leaned their work letter against a light pole at the corner of Lakeshore Drive and Jackson Boulevard, and took down the last signs posted there that marked the path of U.S. Route 66. After decades as America's most famous highway, after carrying hundreds of thousands of people across the heartland of the nation, an American institution had come to an end. Route 66 had been decertified. The legendary highway was dead. America's main street was entrusted to the history books. But in fact, the highway was not dead. Far from it. This venerable road was about to start a whole new life. Another incarnation. To know the story of the Mother Road, you must go back to the America of the Roaring Twenties, when we were between wars and on the wagon. Calvin Coolidge was president, and Henry Ford had just changed everyone's lives by lowering the price of his motor cars. Until that time, there were almost three million miles of roads in America but they were only fit for horse and buggies. Just 1% were able to accommodate the wear and tear of automobiles, and those roads were mostly in the cities. So as motor travel began to stir the public's imagination, pressure was put on politicians to build a year-round practical highway that would link the country. But where to put the new highways? What cities would get the best roads? By 1925, the job of choosing the new highways went to a group of various state highway officials and others, which included an untiring Oklahoman named Cyrus Stevens Avery. Avery would eventually become known as the father of Route 66 for his dogged persistence in establishing what he felt was the perfect route joining the East and the West. Instead of adapting the traditional northern path which followed the historic Santa Fe Trail or the far southern route which tracked the old Butterfield stage line, Avery envisioned yet a third route. His would run between the other two, roughly along the old Gold Road, west from Fort Smith, Arkansas. It just happened to go right through his adopted hometown of Tulsa, Oklahoma. On November 11, 1926, after two years of bickering and compromise over routing and highway designation numbers, state and federal highway officials met in Pinehurst, North Carolina, and signed off on the interstate routes for all 48 states. Avery's choice, eventually called 66, was among them. The highway that connected two-thirds of the continent wound out of Chicago and traversed the gently rolling Illinois farmland. After it crossed the Mississippi River near St. Louis, 66 closely tracked the old Osage Indian Trail and the Wire Road as it cut across the Ozark Plateau of Missouri in a southwesterly direction. It briefly nipped a corner of Kansas before marching across the oil fields and ranch lands of Oklahoma. After reaching the Texas Panhandle, Route 66 sliced through Amarillo and then shot straight into the mountainous country of New Mexico. 
Beyond Albuquerque and Gallup, the highway moved through northern Arizona and the towns of Holbrook, Winslow, Flagstaff. It crossed the Colorado River and entered California at Needles, and then snaked across the great Mojave Desert of Southern California before reaching the Pacific Ocean at Santa Monica, west of Los Angeles. In all, it moved across more than 2,400 miles, three time zones in eight states, touching the very heart of America. As Cyrus Avery had planned, it would become one of the very first continuous spans of paved highway linking the east and west. But more than that, Route 66 became a mirror held up to America. It put us in touch with one another through its necklace of neon lights, Burma shave signs, curio shops, and motor courts. Today, Route 66 means a time before America became generic, when motels didn't take reservations and doctors made house calls. Some things never change. Even in the modern era of jumbo jets, shopping malls, and super slabs, people are turning back to the past. Those of us who truly love Route 66 prefer life on the mother road. We get off the turnpikes and interstates, slip onto Route 66, and return to the way America used to be. We begin our journey down the mother road right after this. Blue highways, those secondary roads that have been eclipsed by the four-lane super slab interstates, have a heart and soul all their own. And Route 66 is no exception. The people who travel them and those who make their living along their shoulders are indeed a unique breed. Keep that in mind as we begin our journey along Route 66 in the Windy City. Chicago, Illinois. The mother road begins or ends, depending on which direction you're going, in front of the Chicago Art Institute on the edge of Grant Park. It then ran due west out of the Loop District until it reached Ogden Avenue. Historically, those motorists who chose to join America's Main Street in Chicago then cut southwest along the city's business route, across the sprawling suburbs of Cicero and Berwyn, before snaking south along the Pontiac Trail toward the prairies, farms, groves, and coal mining country of Illinois, the land of Lincoln. of towns and cities the traveler encounters in Illinois include many that were named for prairie families, early pioneers, or old Indian warriors. Most of them, like here in Pontiac, feature more than one alignment of the old highway. Over the years, the pavement was rerouted as cities grew and traffic patterns changed. Here, you can see several alignments of the old road within sight of a later version. But sometimes, the different alignments take a little detective work to locate. But then, that's the fun of tracking Route 66 and discovering the Mother Road. Route 66 and trucks seem to go together, hand in hand. They always have. And where would trucks be out on the mother road without a good old truck stop? And here we are today at one of the best, one of the earliest ones, the, the Dixie, the Dixie Truckers Home near McLean, Illinois. This was not only one of the first truck stops in the land of Lincoln, in the state of Illinois, but probably one of the first, if not the first truck stop on the entire length of Route 66. And it's still here today doing business, just like it always has, just like it has since 1928. Route 66 was only two years old, an infant, when they opened the doors here at the Dixie Truckers Home. Well, this 
this particular truck stops uh, like a home away from home for drivers. The early days of the Dixie used to be, it was a two-seater restaurant, two-seater operation. Uh, the drivers would take turns waiting in line to get a seat so they could have coffee. It's been a stop for years and years and years. These are our last cowboys, our, our last Don Quixote's out on those big trucks cruising down the road, tilting at windmills. These truck stops mean a lot to them. And the good truck stops, like the Dixie, they keep going forever and ever and ever. If the coffee's hot, if the food's good, if the service is quick, if there's a friendly smile inside. That's what counts, and it means a lot to a trucker. It pays off in big, big dividends. From the Dixie Trucker's Home, Route 66 Road Warriors continue on their southwesterly trek once again. They pass through the state capitol in a city chock full of monuments and memories of Abraham Lincoln. After Springfield comes a slew of other quiet farm towns, and also the famous Our Lady of the Highway statue on Francis Martin's farm near Raymond. Beyond are the towns of Litchfield and the Ariston Cafe, Mount Olive, site of the famous Soulsby service station, and several other strong highway towns that cling to the Mother Road as it makes its way toward the Mississippi River. When the unusual Chain of Rocks Bridge opened in 1929, it was a two and a half million dollar two-lane toll bridge that carried Route 66 traffic across the Mississippi until the 1960s. This is one of the few bridges in the world with a radical bend in the middle. And it's still a favorite, although it hasn't carried traffic in many years. Today, it is still possible to walk along the same narrow pavement that helped thousands of road warriors across the Mississippi for decades, walk over a dirt barrier, and gaze through a cyclone fence at its rusty iron spans. Vines and brush consume this old relic of 66 that served as one of the many Route 66 crossings. Today, Chain of Rocks remains as a silent tribute to the glory days of Route 66. And for a moment, out here, pausing high above the Mississippi, you just might hear the whispers of a thousand ghosts along the Mother Road. faster, more direct, and safer bridges across the Mississippi feeding into St. Louis, the largest of the Route 66 cities between Chicago and Los Angeles. Down along Chippewa Street, a Route 66 alias in the city. During the high summer, chances are folks will be stacked up 10 deep at the row of windows at Ted Drew's frozen custard stand. I grew up in St. Louis and was weaned on Drew's custard. Whenever Suzanne and I return for a visit, we come here to sign books, see old friends, and of course, fill up on the ambrosia that Ted and his troops still create on premises. Ted's father really got the whole family business going way back when. Uh, back in the early days, not too long after Route 66 was christened, that was, of course, 1926. So he's not tampered with the, with the recipes or, or the architecture, those, those wooden icicles that he keeps up there. It's not a cookie-cutter kind of a place that you can find anywhere along the highway. There's only one Ted Drew's, and it's the best. Just a short distance beyond Ted Drew's wait more memories of the heyday of Route 66. Coral Court, just outside St. Louis city limits, is a noteworthy survivor. This Art Deco motor court is currently closed, but it has been spared from the wrecking ball for now. There is no wonder that the streamlined, modern style architecture with rounded, buff-colored walls, glass block windows, and lintels and parapets of red tile did a booming trade out on Route 66. Adjoining garages, which allowed guests to enter their rooms in complete privacy, also made a hit with couples interested in an illicit rendezvous, or smooth-talking salesmen who had gotten lucky for the night. 
The coral court was the proverbial no-tell motel, but one with a touch of class. Today, sadly, the coral court is no more. We'll tell you what happened to the famous St. Louis landmark in a future Blue Highway show. Next, a trip to Merrimack Caverns in the lead and zinc mines of Kansas when traveling Route 66 continues. Traveling west out of St. Louis, the Blue Highway, I like to call the Mother Road, parallels Interstate 44 as it winds its way down the Ozark Plateau. Beyond the city, long segments of 66 remain in places like Times Beach, Eureka, Pacific, St. Clair, and Stanton. Drive about three miles off Route 66 down a twisting road that leads to the Merrimack River, and you'll find the humble entrance to a vast maze of caverns that were first developed commercially in the 1930s by Lester B. Dill. I've put more people underground and brought them back out alive than anyone else on Earth, he used to brag. He's probably right. So far, nobody has disputed Dill's claim. Merrimack Caverns is a classic Route 66 tourist attraction. I'll even go so far to say it's a tourist trap, and I, and I mean that uh, out of pure love, because it's a very loving place. This is a, a cavern, a natural cavern that's been commercialized and passed on for several generations from the 30s to this very day by the, by the first the Dill and now the Torelli family. We've got actually the grandson of Lester Dill, the man who commercialized this cave. Now we've got his grandson running this cave. My grandfather used to say that what really sells this cave is uh, mystery, romance, and beauty. And as long as you keep those three things going, you, you, you're going to do well. And I think if you take the tour, you'll see that all three of those ingredients are here in this cave. This is the cave where the bumper sticker was invented. I don't know if we should bless them for that or curse them. I started here, as did everybody at the time. Your first job when you started was a bumper sign boy, and you worked your way up to a cave guy. And uh, I started in the 1 4th of July. I put on 527 bumper signs. And so I'm quite proud of that fact. My grandfather was too. is not a thing of the past. It's a thing of today. It's a road to adventure. It's um, exploring America. It's remembering a lot of our past, our history of, of the 20th century. And those remnants are filled with stories of their own. And you can almost hear them as you stand and look at them and, and explore them. Road warriors we're always attracted to the highway. You can still be seduced out here today. This section between Rolla and Springfield is famous among Route 66 roadies for its river bluff scenery and a lovely old steel truss bridge that dates back to 1923. Back on Route 66 in central Missouri, today's road warriors find themselves cruising deep into the Ozarks, past Lebanon, Springfield, the queen city of the Ozarks, and through the shadows of the impressive courthouse in Carthage, Missouri, hometown of the bandit queen, Belle Star. Down past Webb City, a once rich mining town, the old road works its way toward Joplin, and the last stop in Missouri.
Route 66 is only an unimproved two-lane with no curb and no shoulder as it cuts into Kansas, the third of eight states it will cross on its way to the Pacific shore. The center stripes have long ago faded here as the mother road makes its way across just a little more than 14 miles of the Sunflower State, country that turned into a bloody battleground in the late 1930s. There are no monuments or markers here on this road on Route 66 in Kansas today. There's nothing to tell us about what happened here back in the turbulent 30s when this was bloody 66. The blood from miners was shed on this road as they went on strike. John L. Lewis was the head of their union and truckloads and carloads of labor scabs came up and down this road. They were from Missouri and Oklahoma and from right here in Kansas. And they went to battle against the company boys in front of the Eagle Pitcher Smelter, right into the town of Galena over that graceful sweeping bridge where nine of those men were gunned down in 1937 right in front of their union office. It was a terrible, terrible time. Time that we shouldn't forget. So maybe we don't need the official marker or the monument. Maybe the monument's here after all, right there in that two-lane asphalt road. Route 66. There is a memorial to this Kansas town, however, the Galena Museum. The old train depot was moved to the edge of the highway, and Howard Litch and other local citizens began preserving memories of the old mines and the well-used highway the town still loves. These memories are their monument to 66. As along any blue highway, the shoulders of Route 66 are littered with distinctive curio shops and museums, including the National Route 66 Museum here in Elk City, Oklahoma. Every single one offers the traveler a glimpse of our history and culture. No true road warrior worth his or her salt would dare pass one by. Until next time, I'm Michael Wallace. Travel well.